ist die Christian Beer Show. Hey, this is Saul Peña, good friend of mine since childhood. And you were asking me, first of all, thank you for coming today. I know that it was kind of last minute, but I'm super happy to have you today. And we were talking about the length of the podcast and how sometimes they're a little bit too long. And yes, they are. They're sometimes a little bit too, too long and some people will never hear the two hours. Some people will, you know. And my hope is that if you're really interested in the topic, I mean, today we're going to talk a little bit about law and we're going to talk about arbitrage. Is that how you say it in English? Arbitrage? Arbitration. So yeah, we're going to talk about arbitration law and it's going to be fun. And if you're interested in arbitration law, you're probably going to want, going to, want to hear it. If you're not, then you're probably not going to want to hear it. And if the conversation's worth your time, then you're going to listen to it. I think that at the end, I'd rather opt for what feels more natural than cut it earlier than it should. As I did, like last week, I had a great conversation. We were talking, this was uh, Kibi McMahon. She's a clinical psychologist currently in Cornell. And she was talking really cool stuff about empathy and narcissistic personality disorder. And we were talking about how we inherited some characteristics of our family members and how that in some ways define Our, our behavior, and in some ways, something that we have to overcome. And it was beautiful. And then suddenly it was one hour, and I, I decided to stop it at the one hour mark, and I regret it. And I don't want to do it again. So if it naturally flows in such a way that we end up talking for an hour, and that's it, then it's great. But if it's going to be longer, it's going to be longer. And I don't care. I don't know. That's my thought about well, it. I think that's true. And, and thank you very much for the invitation. I feel very honored because you always invite these big rock stars, like my brother, like this girl that you are talking about from Cornell. And I feel like the imposter syndrome here, like I'm just this amateur young lawyer trying to figure out my way in, in, in society and in the world and trying to, you know, to, to figure out how to handle my career in this very competitive field, which is super interesting. So the ones that don't know what is arbitration, keep posted because I think that it's, it's a very interesting and unknown field by, by, by almost everyone. It's like, it's very new in the sense that it has, I guess, 100 years since it has become stronger. And, and, I, and I mean, it's very, very passionate. I, I, I mean, we, we need to get into it more, but, but you will see how interesting it is. Oh, I'm excited. And let, you know, I think it's interesting what you mentioned, this imposter syndrome. I feel like we all have it. We all have it. Especially when, when, when we're immigrants and we practice uh, whatever our craft in a, in a different place, especially kind of like what happened to you, right? Like you're coming from Ecuador, you did law, uh, you finished law school and then you get into this arbitration masters, you went to Georgetown, if I'm accurate. And And then you're surrounded by people that went into really good schools and they're all really, really smart and they make um, interesting points in whatever it is that they're thinking. And what, what's fun is that you probably think similar points because you're probably equally as qualified to be in that situation. But because of the name and because of the prestige of the institutions, of the, uh, the places that these people come from, you, 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 you kind of like become a little bit shy. And, and you doubt your opinions. But let me tell you, you know, I have talked with you multiple times through, for several years. And I, and I know that you're a sm really, really smart person, really, really passionate, very charming, and very confident when you, when you allow yourself to speak it. So, no, there, there's no room for imposter syndrome here. You're completely at the level, uh, whatever level that you decide to be, really. No, thank you so much. That's that's true, and you, I I realized this concept existed when I sat in the first class at Georgetown, and I saw my surrounding, and I saw so many different people from so many different countries talking, you know, and and then the professor started this Socratic method, which is completely new to me, asking people stuff, and I start hearing these people talking so coherently, so bright, and I was like, oh my God, 
I sh should I leave now? <laughs> Why should I know? And I realized that, you know, it's about embracing being in the, in the, out of the comfort zone, going to the library, preparing yourself and realizing that you are at the same level, that you have some different background, different perspective. And that's what made those classes so reasoning to have, you know, all that culture background so different that the conversation gets so interesting because of that. Right. And that's why you are chosen to be there because that's what they want. And that's the beauty of law school abroad that you have you know these hybrid cultures common law big common law lawyers um, in the uk or in for instance in india which also they have the the uk system because they were conquered by 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 the english people and then you have us with the civil law system and these two systems and these two legal trained people in the same room talking about the same precedents and analyzing them from a completely different point of view. So I, to the lawyers that haven't done that, I truly recommend it because it's a mind blowing experience. And, and that's what, I mean, why I love so much my, my experience at Georgetown. And, and yeah, at some point the imposter syn syndrome fade a little bit because I realized that my opinions were also as valuable as them, and my voice and my story was different, and that was also beautiful and interesting. 100%. I think I went through that myself, and, and I think that it happens to a lot of people that pursue higher education in, in a different country, and they end up in a really like a competitive place. When I finished med school, okay, I was in Ecuador, and I was, I wasn't maybe, I wasn't the best in my class, but I wasn't in the top of my class for sure. And I felt very confident about the, my skills over there. And then I come to the US, I start residency in psychiatry at Duke, and I'm surrounded by people that come from Harvard, that come from Hopkins, and they're all in, extremely smart. And of course I felt a little bit insecure. And of course they had some knowledge that I didn't have yet. And it did require for me to take an extra effort to, to match whatever it is that they had that I didn't have. But I also carried a lot of stuff, as you were mentioning, a, a very different perspective in, in mental health, a very different perspective in psychiatry, innovative ideas, and, and all like really I, starting to appreciate yourself and all the potential that you have and, and all the value that, you, that, that is in yourself and you can bring, once you really appreciate that and start using it, then some, suddenly they're, they're like, whoa, you're amazing. And let, let me give you more responsibility. Let me, let me give you more opportunities because there's, there's so, so much more that we could do with you. That's why I became chief resident. That's why I'm here where I am at Memorial right now. And I think that you have a very similar story. And okay, tell me, about arbitration and what led you to do that? Wow, that's, that's an interesting question. So I was in law school in Ecuador and I was working as an in-house lawyer at a very huge um, real estate company here in Guayaquil. And I was doing mainly contracts and corporate law and I was very bored. And I say, wow, this is the big corporate thing. I can't believe it. Like, it was very doing the same thing all the time. And I said, no, like, I don't think that this is my thing. And I started um, investigating a bit of what was going on in the university. And they had, uh, so there is this national contest in Ecuador for moot court for arbitration, a moot court in arbitration. And most of the top schools of the country, like the Universidad de San Francisco de Quito, and are very involved in this. And the, my university, La Universidad Católica, the Catholic uh, University of Guayaquil, also had a team. And they had a great team because, in fact, uh, one of the professors uh, in the faculty was the director of the Center of Arbitration of the Chamber of Commerce, which is the most active center for arbitration in Guayaquil. And she was super like into this and into creating academia and preparing and coaching the teams. So she had like a great team of teachers coaching uh, the, the team. And I, and I 
and I said, wow, this can be interesting. Let's let's explore this opportunity. And I and I started in uh, going to the uh, the national mood court, and I realized, wow, this is what I like because arbitration is a, um, so. What is arbitration? Let's 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 start talking a bit so that we can understand what what I'm saying. Arbitration is a, an alternative dispute resolution mechanism where basically the parties renounce the ordinary justice and consent to arbit to resolve their dispute privately. And when I say privately, you choose generally choose a center of arbitration uh, and, and a tribunal that will, will be formed by arbitrators which will resolve the dispute. And what are the, 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 the pros or, or the, the, benef uh, the benefits of this mechanism is basically First of all, you can say, for instance, that you want that the arbitrators are specialized in the issue at bar. For instance, if, there, if it is an insurance conflict or a, an oil and, oil and gas conflict, you can say that they have to have some experience in these areas. And for instance, here in Guayaquil and everywhere in the world, most of the time, arbitrators are people who have had a broad experience in disputes. And most of the time, they're like very academic people, very, you know, multiple jurisdictions, barred at multiple jurisdictions. So they are more qualified than the justices at the this. Mm -hmm. And you can tailor your clause in a way that they are, um, you know, experienced or have so much expertise in, the, in, the, in your issue or in the topic of the contract that you are celebrating. So you definitely guarantee to have a decision of, made by people more prepared. And that's, that's the, 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 I think, the most important advantage. But other than that, most of the time, arbitration is confidential, which is an amazing advantage. Because for instance, if you are in a company who is, uh, that is uh, in the stock market, you don't want people to know that your company is going through a dispute within, uh, with the shareholders, for instance. Mm -hmm. Or just because it has a lot of sensible information that you don't want people to know. And if, if you go to the ordinary justice, you don't have that. Um, another advantage of arbitration, for instance, is that when, when, the, this, when the award, award is called the decision in arbitration, is uh, submitted by the tribunal, you cannot appellate it most of the time. You, it's final. And uh, you have international conventions when you have an international arbitration that you have, for instance, a New York Convention that is signed by more, more than 158 countries in the world, which basically uh, it's, a, it's a convention that establishes the rules to, to recognize and enforce that decision. And so they can enforce it. So even, even if it's international and it's private, and let's say that we agree to do the arbitra uh, arbitration trial or whatever, and then I lose, and I'm like, I don't, I don't care. I'm not going to do the thing. Like, what would happen in that specific instance? Of course, the, the winning party will go to your country and enforce it through the New York Convention, which most likely your country is a signatory, because as I said, 858 countries are uh, parties to this convention. And um, so, and the other thing is that the only resor resource that you have to to, don't, to not recognize the decision is annulment. And annulment has very limited, uh, you know, reasons why you can, you can annul an award. So it's not very easy, it's very, you know, it's very hard. It's like, you can just do that if there are very like, uh, the due process was not made correctly. Like there are very uh, few reasons why you can ask for an annulment and most of the time it doesn't happen. So, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a fastest process than doing it in the ordinary justice where where you can appeal you can go to you know casación which is another resource for instance here in Ecuador there are plenty of resources that you can uh, that uh, to I mean in which you cannot recognize a decision in the ordinary justice and it can be a battle that lasts forever while in arbitration it's faster generally. And the, the process to recognize, as I said, and uh, a decision in arbitration has this convention, which makes it, makes it also m much easier and, and faster. So that are like the main 
reasons why I, why I believe that arbitration is a right mechanism to choose when you are in the private spectrum. But also, when you are, for instance, investing in, 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 uh, in, in Ecuador, let's say, uh, there are, there is, there, that's what I was talking about before, that's called commercial arbitration. But there is another world called investment arbitration. And the basis of these arbitrations are not contracts, are bilateral investment treaties, in which two countries, for instance, decide that they are going to protect each other investors. And in, if in some, for some instance, uh, someone have a, a problem with uh, an investment in, let's say, Ecuador, let's say that there is the, US, the, the bilateral investment treaty between Ecuador and the US. So a US citizen come and invest in Ecuador, he will have some protections, international protections to that investment. So in case that the Ecuadorian state decides to, like it happened in Correa's time, that he was going to, sh to change completely the oil and gas agreements that he had with, the, with uh, Burlington, Chevron, for instance. He changed the percentages of, the, of, the, of how they were going to split the, the profit of the extraction of oil and gas. Yeah, I remember then, that. It was kind of intense. I think that, that Correa, what he, I don't know, what he tried to do is that percentage-wise, he said, okay, now the profits of the oil companies are going to go like 99% to the government, 1% to Chevron. Yeah, Ecuador. it was 80-20. He, he, okay. So let's say that, for instance, oil and, the oil and gas companies had 80% of the, of the profit. He completely reversed it. So he said, no, this time, because the oil price went up. So, of course, he wanted more. And he decided to do it like that. And of course, a lot of arbitrations came after that because obviously this, this, uh, there was a bilateral investment treaty with U.S. in place, which protected the investors and said, you, you, of course, you're going to change the, the rules of, of, of the play in the middle of the play in the game, right? So that's to say in, a, in, a, in an easy way. And then Korea decided to denounce all the bilateral investment treaties that Ecuador had signed with the UK, with the US, I, it was around 11 or 10. And the, so he broke off of, from all of them? All of them, because he didn't like that he was losing all the arbitrations, the international oh. and Ecuador had to pay millions of millions of dollars. And, and now we, we do not have bilateral investment treaties. And the, the worst part, is that in the constitution, in the 2008 uh, Montecristi constitution, he, well, the, the congressman brilliantly decided to put a, an article that is a 422 article of the constitution, which basically bans arbit international arbitration. Not completely, but it, it, it has an exception that if, for instance, if, if the arbitration is celebrated in, in Latin America, it will be accepted, but that's very broad, that's very not convenient. And of course, after all what Perea did, Ecuador was perceived like an anti-arbitration country. So it was terrible and it is terrible. And now the Constitutional Court of Ecuador, who now, thank God, it's different than, than Perea's time. I, I think that it is formed up of very academic people and justices. Among, among them, there is my mentor, that, do you remember that I was talking about this professor that was uh, the director of the Center of Arbitration? Well, mm -hmm. now she's institutional court justice. And um, basically they have to interpret this article. And that's very important for us because we need to sign bilateral investment treaties and countries are not gonna sign that without an arbitration clause. So the interpretation of that article will, will allow Ecuador to re-sign uh, bilateral investment treaties if they interpret it in the way that is favorable to arbitration, saying basically that the ban is not total. And it's because I don't want to get into substantial, but into substantial area because that would be very boring, but basically they wouldn't, they didn't draft it in the correct way. So it's, it has a way to go around it and say that basically it is investment arbitration, for instance, is not banned. Oh, I see. And it's, it's the wrong words because they don't know it. That's a problem that, you know, when ignorance and ideology is governing 
and is pressuring people to do stuff that they don't know this happens. And it's, ah. it re it's a really terrible thing for investment. Yeah, I can totally see that. And I mean, taking a step back for, for the non-Ecuadorian people listening to this, Korea was a president that we had for a long time in Ecuador, a very socialist guy. And, and he did some good things, but he did a lot of pro problematic things. One of them is breaking all, all those bilateral relationships with other countries in terms of arbitration. And if I'm a company that wants to invest in Ecuador, and I realize that whatever dispute that I could potentially have with the country is going to be solved by the government, basically. That's what it means, right? Like if there's no arbitration, that means that there's no neutral party taking, taking this issue into consideration. That means that the government's going to deal with it. Then I'm probably not going to go into business with that country. And that's a problem because that reduces the amount of people wanting like external parties trying to invest in the country, which is, of I think. Of course. And of course. And that is a thing that happens everywhere. I mean, in Latin America, it's a, bit, it's a bit worse because there is this perception, I dare to say, that courts are not impartial, that the government controls them sometimes. And when the state is at play, most of the time, it will win. I mean, not most of the time, but most likely, and in, the, in Korea's government, we know that there was a control, a heavy control of, of justice, that it was kidnapped, I, I would say, by, 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 by him and by his party. And so, of course, who would want that? But even if, if, if it's not Latin America, that, of course, there is this perception, and obviously any investor would like to have a neutral uh, party, a neutral tribunal, who is not corrupted by anyone who will decide impartially. But um, other than that, if you are Chinese and I am Ecuadorian, even if I know that my justice is however it is, I know my justice. I know how it plays. Even if I'm not a lawyer, I have my lawyer here. He, you know, you feel comfortable with what you know. And what you know is your system. Mm -hmm. And this happened for the Chinese guy in China signing a contract with you. So what is the most healthy thing, to, or the healthier, sorry, thing to do? Let's sign an arbitration agreement. Let's do, a, a, let's resolve our dispute through an arbitration in Paris, where you choose one arbitrator, I choose the other one, and the third one is chosen by the uh, arbitration center that will resolve the dispute. Let's say the ICC of Paris, the International Chamber of Commerce, who has, uh, so that's, a way to, I mean, it's a win-win for everyone because you truly feel that the conflict is going to be solved in a way where everybody is happy with the people who is resolving it. And then no one has an advantage because it's not in a system, it's not in your country, it's not in mine, it's not under your law, it's not, you know, you, it's, yeah. it, everything is more neutral. I can see how that can seem more exciting than like your corporate job in Ecuador. So you find out, you're in Ecuador, you're like, oh, I'm a little bit bored. This is the same thing every day. I'm just signing these papers, not that fun. And then suddenly the world of arbitration comes to your mind. And then what happens? And then I decided, so I talked with this woman who is the, uh, the now uh, constitutional court justice, who is my mentor, and I told her, you know, I think I really like arbitration. And she told me, okay, let's come and intern in the center of arbitration so that you can see domestic processes, which are very interesting, interesting as well. And I remember they had this case with a Chinese company who was in charge of putting all the fiber optic of the country. And there was a field between a uh, state company, I don't remember if it was the, the Senel, let's suppose the electric company, because they were fighting because apparently the, someone didn't, did the, didn't do the maintenance as they should, so the fiber optic was broken and the internet in the country was not well. 
And then a lot of experts were coming in and I realized, wow, every case is a world. Every case of a different, and if this happened in domestic arbitration, imagine at the international levels where you have actually states and investors in investor investment state arbitration, for instance. And well, then I, I decided, you know, I really like this. This is, every case is a challenge. Every case you have to, you know, you need to understand very complex contractual situations and, and with a lot of underlying different fields of law intersecting. And that's fascinating. You never get bored. And, and then I started, and then Chevron, Burlington cases started popping up and I, I realized, wow, these cases are, you know, international cases are even more interesting because you have, uh, you have environmental laws, you have environmental, uh, indigenous people's rights, you have, you know, human rights, environmental law, a lot of things going on in one single case. And that's one example. But then you have, like, when I was in Washington and I was working at White and Case, I could see cases where tax measures were on, on this, were the issue, or uh, another case where sovereign bonds were at issue. Imagine that, sovereign bonds of a country. Um, then uh, another case where an environmental regulation in mining uh, of a country was also at play and then it changed the rights of the mining investment company. And wow, everything was one different world. And I was seeing all these cases at the same time and learning about mining law in Colombia, Peruvian law regarding bonds and, and and international law, of course, like the treaties that were regulating this arbitration or, or under which these arbitrations were taking place. And I said, that this is the adrenaline that I need. I realized that that was adrenaline I, I needed in my life. And, and that's why I love arbitration. That's amazing. You know, what I'm thinking as you, as you speak about all these different instances is that it can get exciting to work here because, you, you know, we, we both come from Ecuador, a very, very, in my, like, I think you agree, a very corrupt country when, when it comes to law and comes to government. And even, even though Ecuador may be one of the most corrupt countries in the world, I don't know, every single country, regardless of where you practice, when, when the case, when the stakes are high, there's a lot of political influence or lobbying of some sort that will kind of like shape the course of the outcome of, of a potential uh, dispute, but it sounds like arbitration is actually partial, or I don't know, you tell me, like, do you think that there, what, what are the chances that corruption could occur in these kinds of trials? I, I think it can't. To be honest, I think that arbitrators are truly honorable, honorable people. Um, I, I mean, there has been some instances for, I, I, there was a thing with Odebrecht and Peruvian arbitrators that happened recently and they were in jail. So even if that happens, I think that consequences also happen. And, and let's forget about jail. If the international community learns this, you will be expelled from it. Like international community, I think it's one, I mean, international law community is one of the most rigorous in terms of academy, in terms of, in terms of everything. So if you have this perception, because it's not proven yet from what I learned that these arbitrators were corrupted, it was one arbitrator actually, that seems that Odebrecht could in some way influence them. So what happened? Tell us a story. So I, uh, to be honest, I don't know the exact story, but I'm going to tell the story that is what I know. And it's basically, uh, there were some cases regarding Odebrecht, and apparently this arbitrator, most of the time, was selected by Odebrecht as an arbitrator. Mm -hmm. And he tended to favor Odebrecht in his decisions all the time. And then he was accused of receiving some bribes, of receiving some bribes by the bridge and they were investigating that and what I learned was that uh, he was in jail which is a very huge thing because he was a super prestigious arbitrator 
a, a Peruvian arbitrator actually, and uh, and they said that the process was not fair because while they're investigating you, they shouldn't bring you to jail unless they have a very good reason to know that you're going to escape, for instance. Mm -hmm. but even in that case, they can put you this uh, thing in the feet, you know, in your foot to, to track you if they, I mean, there are measures. Jail is the ultimate ratio measure. Like, it shouldn't be that, ah, we fear that you're going to escape, then we're going to put you into jail. And so apparently this was a very political case, of course, and that's like he was this trophy of this government that, ah, you know, uh, this arbitrator so, uh, was, was all the time like attacking the Peruvian, because I think that the, also the, it was the Peruvian state involved in these cases as well. So it was sort of, I, I guess that it, it was also perceived by the international community as a political revenge. And, uh, and, and of course, I saw a lot of support for this arbitrator from the international community. So now, I don't know what is happening, but I, I will try to uh, keep you posted on that. But, but that is very rare. rare. Like, right. it, it, I think it's the first case where an arbitrator is taken to Yale and something like this happens. So, and of course, that's scary because we believe, and I believe that arbitration is the best mechanism and, and corruption most of the time doesn't happen, but then you have a case like this and you say, well, there are so you know, many stakes in these cases too, and so many powerful companies in these cases as well, where these things can happen, right? It's not perfect, any system is perfect, and we humans also are not perfect, so these things happen. But I think in a very, very small amount, like, Compared to ordinary justice, this is almost. So it, it sounds like it's uh, the chance of uh, of corruption occurring is it's way smaller than a, a, any traditional mechanisms of law. You know, it's mm -hmm. it sounds it, it it definitely sounds interesting. Did I ever tell you that I had I thought for uh, like a couple of months about doing law instead of medicine for a little bit. Wow. I, yeah. I, there, when I was in second year med school, I quit med school and, and then I moved to Denmark and I, ha I was having an existential crisis. And the first thing that I thought was, well, maybe I'll become a musician because that's really something that I wanted to do, but I'm not that good at it. You know, I'm not that good. I know how to play guitar moderately well. I, I, I sing very mediocrely. And so I decided, well, I'm not going to do that because I'm going to be poor the rest of my life. I don't want to do that. And then I thought, well, I kind of want to do law because I would love to be involved in politics and, and, and help my country be a little bit better. But I thought, I, this is such a corrupt country, such a corrupt country. There is no way I'm going to make it. Like, I'm going to be like mudded in into the, all that corruption. I'm going to become a corrupt dude. And I, I just rather not do that. And it sounds like you found the loophole of, of this system, which is arbitration, a, a way in which you can, or at least the chances of you being involved in, in this kind of shady uh, circumstances will be very minimal, if at all. That's true. Like, I, I remember when I started practicing law, when I was a student, I was not yet a lawyer. And... I saw, I, I had to go to, to some court sometime and I, and I also had to go to some public uh, registration, public property regist registration center or, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and people here expect you to bribe them or to pay them to do their work, to do their work, their actual work. So I was shocked and I said, like, this has no remedy. Like I... I am one, and then the system is so damaged with corruption that it's very hard to change it. It's honestly, it's an octopus. It's everywhere, and it's sad to say, but I guess that it will take, I don't know what it will take to change it. It's, and, and, and yes, that's another thing that I, I truly like about arbitration, that I feel like even if these cases like this one of the Peruvian arbitrator happened, 
happened because obviously nothing is perfect. This is the most, you know, proximate thing to perfection in justice that we can have. And, uh, and also it's a tool to, and, and I'm, I'm going to shift a little bit, but I forgot to say something important. And this that I believe that these treat these investment treaties and the fact of the fact of being a country for, friendly for uh, to arbitration really really calls investment because it's a message that you are giving you are open to that you are open to 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 neutral firm, firms to decide disputes and that's what we need like if we want to attract investment and we need investment for development we need to enhance these mechanisms and and we are now, and I'm, I'm going to talk about that later, but we have these, um, uh, there is this big movement in arbitration called Very Young Arbitration Practitioners. And it has a lot of uh, objectives, objectives, sorry. And it, I mean, Paris has one, Madrid has one, uh, Latin American countries, almost a lot of them have, and we just created it in the pandemic, like Ecuadorian chapter for the Very Young Arbitration Practitioners. And one of the main objectives of this group is to be a think tank for public policy and to promote law reform in a way that we become a country that is more friendly. After, we, after this terrible regime that we, have, we had in the past, very against arbitration and that had made the world seem like as a country that didn't like arbitration and didn't want to honor the arbitration, uh, the awards that were rendering the, the ICSID, the International uh, Center for, for, for Disputes of the World Bank, which is uh, the, the mechanism, the most common uh, mechanism for investment arbitration. And then we need to change that. And I, and I, and I think that that's, that's a way to attract investment and promote development. And we, I think we are building an incredible team of professionals, very young professionals with a lot of, you know, ambition to have this country progress. And, you know, we believe that arbitration is one of the tools that we need for that. So we will fight, at, you know, for it and we are doing it and I'm super excited and let's see how, what happens. But we want to really, engage into the conversation and into the, for instance, we want to, to promote the reform of the law of arbitration of the country, which we can make it better. We want to, to uh, produce um, an amicus curia for the court regarding the interpretation of the article that I was talking before in the, co in the constitution that blocks and bans the, uh, international arbitration. And so, so on, so on, so on, but we really want to get engaged into reform because we need we need law reform to start everything so so what do you need to, for that to actually happen i mean it's it does sound i don't know anything about arbitration but what you're telling me sounds beautiful but i don't I, I don't know right and so what what do you need for that to actually happen for the country to embrace arbitration again what, what do you need to do well, I, first of all, I think we need a change of ideology, of political ideology, because at the end of the day, everything is political in the sense that, ah, I'm, I'm a socialist government. I don't want to be ruled or obey my international, com, you know, compromises, my international conventions, my international, my bilateral investment treaties. I don't want to honor that because I want to do whatever I want because I have my sovereign power and I decide whether the, the, the oil and gas contracts are 80-20 or are 20-80. So I'm the dictator here. I, I decide as I wish. So, and that's what happened. And I think that it has a lot to do with how do you see public policy, international public policy, and how do you see um, the economic model? Because if you believe in a free market, if you believe in investment, if you believe that that's a way for progress, then you are a pro-arbitration government, of course. That's the only way to attract investment. And that's where we, you know, we have this transitional government which is so was and has been so weak and has so many other issues going on that 
sadly, this has not been their priority. And, and I know that they, in some way, they want to, to improve this, but other issues are more, more urgent now. So they just uh, put it there and, I mean, let's see, because I, I believe that, so the decision about the Article 422 is up to the Constitutional Court now. And, uh, well, let's hope that they decide that it needs nine justices in favor. And it is known that some justices are very socialist. And uh, that's hard because they don't understand reasons. They don't understand, they don't want to understand what arbitration is. They just say, and that's giving up sovereignty to developed countries. And that's so, not- Let me ask you something. So could it be, I mean, it, it sounds almost illogical, right? Like the, uh, that, that somebody would not want to have an impartial, fair, potential trial with people that want to invest in a country, right? Like you, you want to have an, an, an impartial way to deal with issues when they come. And, and it's weird that somebody would, would not want it. So what I'm thinking is like, could it be that these treaties, these international treaties you're talking about, is it that they are unfair in some way? Are there, is it possible that is it unfair for the country in some ways? Like, is that ar an argument that they're saying or they're just like not, well, like what's going on? Okay. so. And this is, this is going to take us to another complicated topic. And there, there is actually now, nowadays, there is like a criticism towards the investment, the investor state arbitration or the investment arbitration regime. Because some countries allege that it is a bit, the, the, the treaties that were made up in the 60s, 70s, the first of them, of course, they didn't know what arbitration was. It just was beginning. The system was new. So basically there were ambassadors who went and signed this, take some wine and sign this without knowing what they were signing. <laughs> Isn't that the best way to sign a treaty that will of course. completely change the future of my country? Let's just grab some wine and sign some papers. Exactly. And so what happened is that the, the treaties tend to protect investors a lot. And that's right, and that's true. But that's a two-way street because it will also protect my, my Ecuadorian investments in the US, for instance, which is less common. So of course, at the end of the day, who ends up having a lot of protection are the US investors, for instance, just to put the example into a more real uh, example. And so basically, yeah, the, the, the treaties, I, I get it. It, and I, and I, I actually, I think that they, they should be designed in a, way, in a way that is more equal for everyone, in the sense that the state should also have some rights, not only obligations, not only obli obligation to respect the investment and the, and the, you know, whatever they agreed on the contract where they signed and agreed to the investment. And, and for instance, there are some basic um, things that most of the treaties have, and it's like, fair and equitable treatment. Um, uh, well, basically you agree that you are going to respect the investment, give them the protection that they deserve, not going to change in the middle of the contract, the conditions and so on and so on. And for instance, you have for uh, expropriation provision. So you are not going to expropriate. But expropriation is not just like the direct act of taking away property. Expropriation can also be in an indirect expropriation. You can, let's say, what example I can put to you. An expropriation can also be a measure that takes all the value or most of the value of your investment. Let's say that, to put that into an example, um, I am a government, I'm, this is a real case, but I'm not going to give it in a confidential way because I don't think that this is very no, known yet. Mm -hmm. I'm a company and I gave you some mining rights under this mountain. Let's call it the Paramo. Mm -hmm. And then I decide that, you know what? I am going to, to submit a law where, issue a law where uh, you cannot mine in, in the areas that are considered 
para. Hmm. What? That takes away all my area, right? right? All the lights, all that you recognize, all the licenses that you gave me. I have invested $2 billion here, for instance, and now I cannot mine. How can you tell me this? That's an indirect expropriation, for hmm. example. And that's a, an example to put, um, you know, in, in the real world, what happens and how. So this is what this, these treaties protect in, uh, investors from. But the, these treaties do not give states much power. For, ex, for instance, a state cannot go on and put a claim to an investor that is not complying with X, X uh, obligation that they had under the investment contract. For instance. I see. And that sounds unfair, uh, right? Like you want to make that's sure- a bit, that That's a bit unfair. And then for instance, a state can also, that's debatable, but most of the time, the state under the treaties cannot counterclaim. And, and Ecuador had a historic case in which Ecuador was able to counterclaim. And I wrote a piece on that because it's very interesting. The Burlington case, the Ecuador, Ecuador was able to counterclaim for environmental damages, the investor. But that was because the investor allowed Ecuador to do that. They signed a compromise in which they both agreed that Ecuador was, you know, had teeth to do that. But the, the treaty didn't give Ecuador those teeth to do that. So mm. that's, and that's something that I, I really think that on the right side, not having treaties right now will allow us to sign better treaties and more fair treaties. And that's, that's a fair criticism of the system. But the truth of the matter is that the system will continue and that in governments like ours and in countries like ours, where you have this pendulum, this changing governments, whereas you have one day this government that believes in free market, welcomes investment, and then in the other four years, you have a socialist like Rafael Correa who will come and take all whatever the, the prior government promised you away. And then it's that, that I can defend myself on an international arena and that you, in, you know, and receive my indemnization for that, at least, right? You know, it's funny because I remember that Chevron case in which there was like a, a, a very horrible disaster that occurred in the Amazon. And, and if you tell me that, that governments or a country are not allowed to put a claim regarding the company not being safe or, not, or, 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 or just like making this havoc, then of course I'm gonna be pissed at arbitration because I'm not allowed to defend my nature, right? Is, is that a, a fair thing to say? I mean, you can defend yourself whenever the claimant comes and defend you, and sorry, and sue you under the treaty, but you can also, then you can also do it in your justice. You can go and actually, it ha that happened in the Chevron case. Actually, the indigenous people go, went to the Lago Agrio court and filed a claim because they were dying of cancer and it was super, uh, con there was a lot of contamination going on there in the Amazon. But the truth of the matter regarding the Chevron case is that the, the decision in the Lago Agrio was proven in New York under a RICO case to be corrupt and to be ghost written by, by, the, by the claimants. So mm. asking for $9.5 million, I don't remember how much, but that's a decision that is not enforceable anymore, anywhere almost, because it's, it was ghost written and it was a denial of justice. It, it was terrible. So that's why Ecuador is losing the, the Chevron case. And uh, it has lost every instance because they followed a procedure in Ecuador to Chevron that was completely unfair. I am not saying that Chevron is a saint. I don't believe that. Uh, don't get me wrong. Yeah. But also it's true. And I, I, I have studied that case for some purposes that I cannot reveal. I, I am not an expert because it's a very huge case. Mm -hmm. It has taken more than 30 years now, it started, I guess, in, in, in 98, in the 98, or somewhere there. And the, so Texaco was first the, the first company to come here and exploit those oil fields. And then che, the, Texaco was acquired by Chevron, merged, whatever. And Chevron made Ecuador sign an agreement in which they, Ecuador, were responsible for cleaning the oil fields and everything that Petro Ecuador had exploited before Texaco came in the first place. So these oil fields were the, the Chevron 
uh, investment and uh, exploration take place uh, was actually first handled by Petropolo. So it is very hard but the truth of the matter is that experts, international experts, in most of the instances also have determined that the contamination was made by, by Petro Ecuador and that in the first place, Ecuador renounced its, I mean, Chevron's responsibility in an agreement back in the 90s, saying that they were going to clean everything before Chevron came to continue ex the, the, the explosion of the, uh, it's not explosion, the word, sorry. Exploration. Sorry. It, it, it's, it's not exploration because it was actually um, exploitation of the oil. Got it, got it. Okay, between the two of us, we got some English going on here. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so it's very technical, this uh, oil and field industry, but the point is oil and gas, sorry, industry, but but it, it is, it's, a not, it's not an easy case, and it's a case that has cost, costed Ecuador a lot and will continue costing because I don't, I don't think that Ecuador did the right thing in many instances, so. Yeah, sounds like it didn't follow due process and that's not heard in their case, which is interesting. Yeah. It's, and, and there were, I mean, we cannot say also that the Amazon people have all the fault because there was a New York lawyer called Don Singer who made this film, this movie actually called Crude. I haven't seen the movie, but I know he came here to Ecuador and thought that, you know, that he can handle justice as he wished, as he, as he wished and he interfered in the case, and now he's disbarred. And actually he had, and, until June, that I was actually looking a lot into this case, he was with um, Domitila, uh, he was in prison in his house because he did it, because he received, I mean, he was part of all of this mess and, it is proven that he made out of the Ecuadorian justice when he wanted, and he's disbarred. And, and, and I mean, and, and also, of course, he, he was a lawyer of indigenous people. So he um, painted birds, as we said, to them and, and, and made them believe that we, they were going to get a lot of millions out of this. And he didn't, you know, he didn't follow the, the process. He, he corrupted the judges. He goes write the, 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 the judgment. So it, it is a, a very complicated case. And I, I really hope that the saga of the Chevron case, because there have been many awards, like partial awards. And, and I, I think we're expecting the final award by the end of, of 2020 or the beginning of 2021. And I think that will be a hard award for Edward. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I can say, I can imagine that it will cost us a lot. Damn. Yeah, it's, it's sad because I, I understand that there are people that were affected by whoever fault was. And I am very sad that I don't know if they will receive anything out of all this big saga of arbitrations and uh, corruption within the national justice system. So it's just very sad and then has anybody gone to clean that stuff over there i don't think so hmm. they left and they i mean uh, chevron left ecuador and they don't have any intention to come back um worst i mean you know it was a very political case correa was into it that's the worst thing that you can do to a case go out and la mano sucia, the dirty hand, do you remember him going to the, to the oil fields and putting the hand in the oil and, sa and saying, look, this is what Chevron, because then Chevron with the, the right was very upset with Ecuador because they were damaging their image and their name and their brand and their prestige. And it became a personal fight. So Chevron have most of the best law firms in the world like an actual army working in this case. And uh, yeah, Ecuador also have hired very good law firms. I know them, but, but it's, it's a very tough uh, fight. Oh. You know, it's, you know, you, you, you shouldn't, he did everything 
we can write a, a book of what you shouldn't do for international bilateral relationships with your main commercial ally, which is the US. Hmm. Of all what Korea did. Interesting. And then, so I guess I will wait and see what happens. Now, let me ask you something. Yeah. So, you, so we were talking, we, we completely got sidetracked. You were saying that your intern in this uh, arbitration firm, and then- you, I was an international law clerk. I was not an intern, but yeah. Okay, international law clerk. And you worked there for a while and you said, okay, this is my jam. So what does that mean for you and your life right now? I mean, it was an amazing experience. I learned a lot. I learned how intense and fast paced the world of arbitration is and how hectic also these hearings are because I was able to, to, to attend and be part of a hearing. And actually it was super intense. It was an amazing experience, but I, we were not sleeping like for two weeks and we were preparing experts and we had people from a government, like very important uh, witnesses and it was an, a very intense experience and uh, I mean I learned I am very grateful and uh, I, I I sure I know that I mean I know that US law firm environment is like that after this experience and of course in arbitration which is a very demanding field as I'm, as I'm saying is our cases very complex cases where you have many elements in the case. You have experts that measure damages, that talk about very technical aspects. And, and of course, you also have to understand that because in a way you have to help them be prepared for the cross-examinations. And it's, uh, it, 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 has, it, it was an interesting ride and I, I truly enjoyed it. But now I, I am looking, uh, uh, I am, I am interested in, in, in going to Europe and see also their approach to this and, uh, and living that experience as well to, to be able to compare a bit how is, it, how is it different or similar. And honestly, migrational issues happened and that's why I couldn't stay there. But um, I think that firm was a great school and of course it, it, it if I can return there at some point, I will of course take the opportunity, but now my, my, my goal and my plans are to go to Europe and become eventually also an a Spanish lawyer because I am on track of getting my Spanish citizenship. So I oh, get really? Magical. Yeah, because apparently my gra great grandmother was descendant of Jewish, Sephardi Jewish. So we can we, we were able to, to have the well we are we are on track to have the nationality because of them. And uh, let's see, but but I think that if I got the nationality why not get, be barred in in Spain. Of course because that because if you leave, if you're national if you're a citizen of one country of course you should be barred in it. Like that that's not a typical train of thought that any, any person would have, but it, but it sounds like that's something that you, in a way that you think, you know, it's funny, I was thinking, it's gotta be hard. You know, we live in, in 2020 where we, we would wish that there are equal opportunity and equal rights for for, for, it, for females and males in, in, in the work environment. And, it, and we know that it isn't quite like that in, in the developed world, but it's definitely, not like that in the de in the developing world, especially in Ecuador, with a very conservative society, very chauvinistic. And then here you are talking about arbitration and kicking ass, both in the U.S. now in Spain, maybe in London soon. And mm, yeah. I just gotta say that I, I feel like t tell us a little bit about that. I'm very proud of your of your success, and I'm very happy, and I really hope that you continue to do well in your life. Now, but it, I'm sure there's there's a little bit of hardships just because of being a woman doing the thing that you're doing right now? I mean, of course. I, I come from this very, as you said, conservative 
society where you go to the doctor. I, I once went to the Otorrino Laringolo. I don't know how you say that in, in English, but I, I had like a throat infection. And I went to this doctor, I was feeling terrible. And he there to say, ah, how old are you? And I was like, I don't remember, 22, let's say. And he said, ah, and, and then, don't you have a boyfriend? I was like, what? Like, why are you asking me this? But yeah, definitely it's, it's, um, it's a society where most women nowadays want to be housewives and that's perfect. I don't have any objection to that, but I feel that this society needs to evolve and also in a way support women that decide that that's not what they want to do with their lives, right? And I, I, I feel that you have to be very strong in, in your decisions and don't let them choose your path. In the sense that I, I had very, a lot of professors in law school that were very machistas. How, how do you say mach? They're like chauvinistic. Yes, in, 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 they were like, also, where are you studying if you are going to marry? And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, I'm studying because I want to be a lawyer, right? But I, I mean, I, I really hope that we can evolve from that very retrograde ideas and start giving women more space to choose whatever they want and support them. I mean, my parents, they're the best because they have always supported me in every decision that I have made and that's, that makes it better because I can't imagine living in a house where they're pressuring me to get married and have kids. That's not my case, thank God, because I will leave my house if that was the case. And, and yeah, but, but it's true that, that we face a lot of skepticism by people and even by professionals. Like they, even here, like they, you, I mean, I, I remember being in, in shareholder meetings with, with some people like, they look at you like, what are you saying? Like, why are you, why are you talking? I remember being in a, in a shareholder meeting where my mom is a shareholder and I went to represent her and my aunts and I was, they, they didn't have an arbitration clause. And I was like, this is a family company. We should have a dispute, like a, medi a very, it is called like a clausula escalonada. It's a, it's a clause where you have first amicable, you know, you try to go to a, a mediation and as a very last, ultima ratio measure go to arbitration and that's what is recommended when you have a in every, i think in every scenario but not even with more reason when it is a family enterprise right because you don't want to to have a fight with your family because of the and uh, because of the business or whatever and they were like looking at me like this lawyer that does clearly doesn't have idea of arbitration was looking at me like okay we will consider it. Can you please write me, like, send me an email with that? But it's the attitude. It's like, why do you dare to talk? And I dare to, um, I, 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 I want to talk and I have the right to talk, first of all, because I'm representing a shareholder, but also because I'm a lawyer. So stop looking at me like that. And that's, that's hard. But then if, if, I mean, we have to just stand and raise our voices. That's it. Yeah, I mean, I think that in DNA, I don't know, I've never been a woman, but I, I, can, I can see from what you're telling me and from what I see in, 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 in day to day work life, etc. It, it is harder for you guys in, in so many ways. And, and in the end, I, it's something that you said, it really struck to me like, like the, the world wants you to like go in a certain direction and you just can't, you just have to be very certain of who you are who do you want to become and what do you need to do to become that? And, and if you, if you're not certain of, of, of those little things, you, you will become a sort of leaf in the wind, right? Like it, and the, the, the world's forces will take them into what they think where or wherever they think you should fit instead of the place that you want and deserve to be. Exactly. That's, I completely agree to, with that. I mean, you have to be very strong on your goals and your ideas and fight for that. And just, you know, you have worked for it and you deserve it. You deserve to be whatever you want. 
you are the educated person. Uh, I mean, why not? Why not? Well, I wish you all the best, Sol. Thank you so much for talking with me today. And when are you going to Spain? Like, when, when is this, all, this whole thing happening? I know that you're right now in Ecuador, maybe changing arbitration law. That, I hope that happens. And then when, when are you going to London or, or, or Spain? What exactly is the plan? Yeah, I am, I am I'm supposed to leave to London on November 30th. I'm supposed to uh, begin an internship in one of the most important boutiques in our international arbitration in London in December 7, and I'm very excited about that. I was supposed to go in June, but because of COVID I, and migrational, migration issues and lockdowns, I wasn't able to get there. And so they were generous enough to postpone it to until now. And, and that's the plan. I, I hope that COVID allows me to try and continue doing my career. But yeah, now I'm in Ecuador and trying to make the most of my time here. Uh, I, I told you that we are, we are doing this initiative called Ecubia, which for me is fantastic. And I really hope that we can make some impact with, with that. And yeah, that's, I mean, that's a plan. I hope that once I'm in London, I will be able to build a European network, which I, mm, I don't have a very, like a very strong network yet. So I want to build that and, I, and, and take advantage of my future citizenship to continue training myself in international arbitration there. So let's see, let's see how it plays. I, I, am, I don't want to be a leaf in the wind, so I'm trying to be as active as I can to, to get to my goal, that is to be like this uh, person, a, a very focused person in international arbitration and, and why not like a person in Ecuador who can actually build a stronger arbitration community here as well, domestically and internationally. Amazing. I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming and you should come back. Of course. I would love to. I would love to. You mean back to the US or back to the podcast? <laughs> well, I, I meant back to the podcast, but if you want to come to the US and visit, yes, you're also welcome. I would love to. I love New York. It is always a good idea. All right. Take care.